Oh, that's interesting. Apparently you've read the script for the upcoming Hellraiser reboot? Uh, no, no, I haven't. Although I have seen, uh, I've spoken to Clive and he has told me a few things which I'm sworn to secrecy about. Right, um, okay. About, yeah. Somebody's asking about that. Um, yeah. Uh, and somebody's asking whether or not we ever walked into each other. Um, <laughs> on the set of Hail Race and completely <laughs> cool. Actually, we're not live. Not a convention. Not a convention. Uh, just stumbled into each other. Yeah. Oh, but, uh, sorry, Nick. Sorry, <laughs> I think he was actually talking about the Hail Razor. Sorry, guys. Hi, guys. We're actually just chatting away, Simon and I. Uh, welcome to chattering with Nicholas Vince and the luggage in the crypt interview with Simon Bamford. Um, it's very interesting. At the moment, uh, we've got no viewers. <laughs> that's good but I know there are people I don't know why it's telling me we've got no viewers because people are logging I'll have a drink then I'll have a drink then <laughs> normally <laughs> usually within <laughs> um, normally yes. by this stage we get at least one or two viewers but uh, apparently no we don't have any viewers at the moment um, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Nobody! <laughs> Nobody loves me! We've got one viewer! Oh! <laughs> You'll have to be sensible now. It's probably Vicky. Oh. Um, it may well be Vicky. I'm not sure who it is. But Vicky it, Michelle? Uh, Vicky Lowe. Um, and. Yes. And, right, okay. Um, Right, we've got some questions for the end. Okay, I'm going to stop blathering around now, and uh, we've got at least two viewers. Um, so I'm going to talk to the camera, and I'm going to say thank you for joining us, guys. Um, I'm sure some people are going to be joining us during this. Um, just before I get started with the interview with Simon Bamford, who I've been <laughs> chatting with, as you can see. Hello. And he's waving at us. Um, I just wanted to uh, let you know about a couple of things. One. Ooh. Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, it's more than two. It's quite a lot. Um, uh, my web shop on my web. Oops. Uh, Damien Child says he's watching. Excellent. Uh, which reminds me to turn off the notifications on the um, the thing because otherwise I'm going to have dinging going on in my ear. Um, yes, the web shop is open on the. Um, uh, on the website, so it's for ordering signed copies of books and photographs, which of course make great Christmas gifts. Um, so that's www.nicholasvince.com. You can go along there. Some dates for your diary on the 7th of December, in a couple of weeks' time. <laughs> I'm not going to look at Simon. He's trying to put me off. <laughs> um, <laughs> This is what I have looking at my screen <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> um, dates for your diary, 7th of December, and Bobby uh, is joining me for the... Uh, <laughs> for the um, sorry, and Bobby is going to join me for Luggage in the Crypt interview, and we're going to be talking about um, her latest film, uh, which she's written and directed for the In Fear of C uh, series. I'm just getting rid of my... Um, email whilst I think about it um, and then I've got a very, very special event happening on the 14th of December mm. <laughs> um, on the 14th of sen uh, December we're having a Soska Cenobite Christmas special oh. on <laughs> Did we get mistletoe? <laughs> I think we should have mistletoe. Simon, you're invited to join us if you wish. Um, this is the Soska twins, uh, myself, Barbie. Simon, if you're available. The idea is we uh -huh. get together and um, we do... Um, we're going sing to carols. Sing carols. We're going to sing carols, but we're going to tell I ghost suppose. stories. We're oh. going, to, going to tell ghost stories. Three to five minute ghost stories because it's Christmas and you always tell story, ghost stories at Christmas. Oh, so right. we'll probably be doing that for about an hour. And it would be great if, you'd like, if you want to come along and there's a special guest, Simon. Um, but, you know. Was, uh, there's the Soska twins. The Soska twins. You, you and Barbie. Me and Barbie. And they're Soskying me and they're five, three and five minutes long. 
Yes. Yeah. And it's an hour. Yeah. So that's about so that's... 20 minutes of storytelling, plus oh, other special guests. Oh. Mm. <laughs> mm. We, we, could work out, we could work out how many special guests. <laughs> Just by the minutes that aren't being used. Well, it depends on how many, yeah, what we actually do. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's the t so 14, that's the date for your diary, the 14th of December, the Soska twins uh, and Barbie, possibly Simon, if he deigns to join us. <laughs> um, the other thing, I've been running a survey on um, the chattering with Nicholas events, ideas for films and things you'd like to see on this channel. Um, that survey is listed below in the description on the Google Hangout and will be on the YouTube channel. Please fill that in. I've had some very interesting suggestions so far. And no, I'm not presenting the show naked, which is one of the suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> you really don't want to see that. Um, the uh, paper cut, the short film that was premiered, the two-minute short film that was premiered at the uh, London Horror Festival, is now up on my YouTube channel. Um, please head over there and have a look at that. It's on. Uh, you'll see it on one of the playlists there. Um, there is a. I'm going to shout, give a shout out to a couple of podcasts. Um, the Strange and Deadly Show, uh, which is hosted by a mate of mine, Tom Tom Elliott, um, co-hosted. Uh, they're going through the 82 films from the Section 3 Video Nasties list. These films were never quite made the list, but will often be seized and destroyed by the police. Uh, there's things on there like Rabbit and um, Scanners and all sorts of things. Kind of interesting shows to listen to. There's the All Star Jamboree. So, sorry, the All Star Summer Jamboree. Funnily enough, which is a name that was given by Tom, who's done the other podcast. Um, the hosts were previously Mike and I, a couple of dead stoners. Um, I've just been listening to them as a recent show. They're now the show is now uh, hosted by a nervous werewolf and a vampire with multiple personalities. It's going to be horror themed <laughs> sketch comedy. <laughs> I've listened to the last one. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's got some great lines in it. It was very funny. I really enjoyed that. Um, Ball Erectory. Uh, that has literally just been announced this evening that Clive Barker is uh, donating a signed print, uh, one of the limited edition uh, editions of 40 um, that the Century Guild is doing there. That has just been announced as one of the executive uh, producer perks. Um, so you the dig deep, I think it's 750 quid for an executive producer perk. Um, and But you get a signed uh, post, uh, print by Clive. Um, there's a lovely video by um, Ashley Thorpe um, advertising that. Also, you can get um, special signed photographs from me, from both Hellraiser and um, uh, Nightbreed. What was the other movie? I was Nightbreed. Um, I'm also donating the... Hellbound. <laughs> Hellbound. I was in Hellbound as well. You can have one from that if you like. These rather rare things. Uh, can't terribly get easily get the hold of these. Um, I'm donating those to the um, ball erectory. Oh, it's very dirty. Uh, the ball erectory. I'll clean them and I'll sign them before I send them out to you. Um, and just so you can see it as well. Oops, I'm knocking over Chatra. Paper cut. Look for that in paper cut. Um, that was a gift that was given to me by John Mon John von Pye. So. Uh, oh, and the other thing is, I'm just going to give a, a quick plug shout out to a thing called uh, to a YouTube channel called Owen and Co. Um, he does some very funny videos. He's just done one, um, my first day on Star Wars, uh, which has just been published and doing very well. Uh, he does a great cartoon uh, when Lionel met He-Man. That's very funny as well. So I'll give uh, I'll give it to that. Are you smoking? What are you doing, Simon? Simon, what have you got in your hand? <laughs> <laughs> Simon, stop trying to get attention. We're with you now. The show's all about you now. <laughs> yeah, it's better be. It's better be. <laughs> Me. Yes, it's all about you. Yeah. <laughs> so, Simon, we're going to do the luggage in the crypt interview now. Right. And we're going to start with your film choices. And okay. your, 
your first choice, I'm just going to flap, put this up very briefly, was The Tree of Life, directed by Terence Malick. Now, ah. I've seen, now, I've seen clips of it, particularly Brad Pitt and The Boy, but I've never actually seen the film. So tell me about The Tree of Life. The Tree of Life is very difficult to tell, to tell you about it because you have to, it's one of those films you have to experience. And one of the reasons for taking it into a crypt would be it would take probably eternity to work out <laughs> what it's about. <laughs> but it's kind of um, ah, it it it's it's it starts off kind of in space and with dinosaurs, uh, and then um, it talks about uh, it goes about um, a loss of a child, and. Um, he's he's a genius. Terence Malick, as a director, has a way of creating a whole new genre of filmmaking, and he's constantly pushing the boundaries of of what's possible. And 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 when you're watching it, you become very aware of how we we actually experience life. In that, we I mean I don't know about you, but I don't concentrate that hard. And uh, and so you're, you're constantly, you know, I'm talking to you now, but I'm looking at a book over there, then I'm looking at your face, and then I'm kind of trying to think. So I'm kind of looking at whatever's in the room. And and and, and my experience of life is little fragments of, of, of things. And so he'll, he'll, he'll have a whole section where there's somebody talking here, and then there's this like a close up of their eye like that. And then and then it's just their mouths talking. And then it might just be a car going across the road or something completely random. And as I understand it, that's kind of what he's doing because he's talking about memory quite a lot of the way at the time. And, and especially with memory, you, you think in fragments. You don't, you don't remember whole things. It's not clear. Okay. Or, or necessarily truthful. Now, I might have got that completely wrong. You have to... You, it's like a great poem or a great bit of prose or a, a fantastic painting. You have to experience it for yourself and make your own decisions about what it is. So it's 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 great fun. It's hugely poetic, um, and uh, I, I highly recommend it to anybody. Cool. But, um, it's not necessarily easy. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Well, that one sounds absolutely fascinating. Sorry, I just realised something. I've skipped a question, um, which okay. I should have asked you first of all. What is your view of the afterlife? Um, well, I've, I've always been brought up, and I always believe that there isn't one. So I think this is it. You kind of make the most of it, and um, you live life to the full. You try to enjoy it as much as you can, and there's constrictions on that, sadly, which you learn as you get older. But you know, you still got to earn a living. You still got to, there's still got to be down times and boring times, and so you just try and make the most of it. And then, and then, as life goes on, you kind of get. I don't know. You get a, you get this wonderful life experience, which kind of builds up without you really knowing it until you start looking back and thinking, "Wow, I've done this and I've done that," and 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 everybody can look back and think, "Wow, I've done this and I've done that, and I've achieved this and I've achieved that." And uh, so, yes, I I don't believe in afterlife. I believe um, I, I, the Doors song, um, "This is this is the end. This is the end, my friend," and I think. That's true. I think uh, so. Um, um, my luggage in the crypt would be um, a time capsule for aliens. Um, that when Armageddon is, is when we kind of made a real mess on all of this and destroyed the Earth, and the, the aliens came down and trying to work out what it was we were and uh, what, what what was our experience of life. Um, they'd find my time time capsule, and, and this is what they'd find inside it. Okay. And they'd be very confused. <laughs> Especially if they were to look at Terence Malick's Tree of Life, they go, whoa, they were surreal. <laughs> Actually, surreal is something is is a kind of through line in this interview, I think. I love surreal. I've okay. always loved surreal. Okay. Speaking I, I, was, uh, I was in Ohio recently, and my sister-in-law took me to the Kent, uh, the Cleveland Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. And uh, she wanted to go and see the Great Masters, and they had a, a special exhibition of, uh, of surrealist art. And, and photographs, and so we went, <laughs> and I was in my element, I was loving it, and I could see, you know when you go to an art gallery with somebody, and they're, they're just not getting what you're getting, and they're, and there's this kind of, oh, that's nice, yeah, that's very interesting, yes, anyway, <laughs> should we move on? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but keeping with the um, the surreal theme, yeah. um, this is your next choice, which is Mulholland Drive yeah. by David Lynch. Well, there's okay. two reasons for choosing this. Okay. Uh, what, one that I was I was on Mulholland Drive recently, like a few weeks ago, um, for the Nightbreed um, premiere, and Anne Bobby has friends. This is a long story. Anne Bobby has friends uh, who she one of which was an actor uh, that she did a production of Godspell with, with Stephen Schwartz evidently uh, attached to it. So he was around. Um, who wrote Godspell? He did. He wrote the music for Godspell. Yeah, That's he wrote right. the yeah. Um, and she's good friends with him. And Babri, of course, is the lead in, in Nightbreed. And uh, she's kept in contact with this other actor uh, from Godspell, who's now a who moved to um, Los Angeles and is now a um, chief executive at DreamWorks. Um, and he has this fantastic house that was used in Total Recall that is shaped like an eye. It's just the most amazing house, shaped like an eye, up on the hill, in, in, the, in the hills up there. Um, and in Total Recall, it gets shot down, I think, and it kind of the whole house kind of falls down there. Down this, is the, this is the original Total Recall. Yes, the, yeah. yes, this. Yes, yeah, yes, not the, the 19, remake. The 1920s 80s. film. <laughs> 80s, I think, 90s, 80s, 90s. Anyway, it was good. I loved it. Um, and anyway, she she uh, I got to sit next to them uh, or with them at the premiere, and she was staying at their house, which was this amazing house on Mulholland, and she invited me around the next day. So I went to this house on Mulholland Drive. So that's the first thing, and the second was it was directed by uh, David Lynch, and again, he's just one of my heroes. I would love to work with David Lynch. His films are fantastic, and and a little bit in the same way that Clive will will start off w uh, uh, as a an experience of of their work. You you start off with something very real, and then you're you're gradually kind of taken on this journey into something completely impossible and bizarre. Um, but because you're taken so skillfully and craft and the craft is so good, you just go with it and and you believe everything you're seeing. And I think um, David Lynch is a is a master of that. And I'm so excited to hear that they are remaking um, Twin Peaks. Is a TV series or is um? Yeah, they've just announced it uh, a couple of weeks ago that yeah they're redoing Twin Peaks. I'm not sure if it's they're remaking it or if they're taking it to the next level. But uh, yeah, he tweeted about it evidently on Twitter. Uh, I t uh, I did see something about it. I wasn't sure if it was a remake or if there was is a continuation we, or. Were you with me when we met? Um, we met the log lady. Uh, at a convention. We did. We did. And, she's uh, lovely. I, I, she's absolutely lovely and very intelligent, and as everything you expect from a David Lynch lady. And and I still have. She gave me a twig because she was she was signing bits of wood. And, uh, and <laughs> I remember. She gave me a twig, and I have it on my mantelpiece. And I'm so proud when everybody looks at it and goes, "Why have you got a bit of wood sitting on your mantelpiece?" I go, "Because it's from the log lady." <laughs> Very exciting. Uh, very, very exciting. Very. It was, she was absolutely amazing. She told us a lot about the making of a razor head and David, the way David Lynch supported his whole cast and so. On. That's the great. Razor head was fantastic, wasn't it? It's oh my god! Bizarre. The sound on that was amazing. I remember seeing that when we were at drama school. Actually, we going to see it at the Scala Cinema. We did. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I may have been with you. It was an extraordinary experience. Extraordinary. Incredible. And there'd been nothing, nothing like that before. Uh, no. No. I mean, just no. It's so lovely that, that voices like that are heard, and then the, the, it's so easy for somebody like that to just disappear. And I'm sure there are quite a few directors as good as that who've never had the chances. But David Lynch was allowed to come through. Um, yeah. Yeah. And okay. And your him. next choice is. Citizen Kane by Orson Welles. Yes, because I've never seen it. <laughs> I'm ashamed to say, and everybody, everybody says it is, you know, the best film ever made. So if you're going to be kind of locked away in a, um, in a crypt, or if the aliens are going to come and find me, then they ought to see something that we consider we is considered to be the best film. It's... And they might think. I, yes. Is it the best film ever made? 
it's probably damn close. Is it absolutely fascinating? Did he get into so much trouble for making it? Um, yeah, because Randolph Hearst destroyed his career after that. Um, there is certain in jokes, uh, um, which were basic, obviously pop. I mean, the whole thing is about could be taken as a hot, as a pop at Randolph Hearst around the Hearst newspapers. It's it's great. Uh, it's right. I mean, in terms of camera work and storytelling and just the whole thing and and the way it's shot and it's awesome wells yeah no it's brilliant it really is a fascinating film but um well done for yeah i there are so many of these great movies i've not seen as well but that one i happen to have done <laughs> cool all right so let's move on to your um your books yay i like this one i obviously could only get some of the covers for the next one you would like to take right. <laughs> the complete works of well, Aberat, all five books in one compendium. Well, if we're only allowed three books, then I'd take, if you can take the complete works of Shakespeare, you yeah. should get in one kind of big, thick yeah. book, then you should be able to get the complete works of Aberat yeah. as well. Yeah, I'm sure they're going to do a big, they, they, you know. Eventually. Eventually. But you can have a Kindle in there as well if necessary, I'm sure. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, well, I love Aberat. I, 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 uh, uh, I just candy Quackenbush and her fabulous adventures as, as something that I'll be following for a long, long time. So, um, and I'm always so excited and Clive's such, so clever at, um, at, you pick them up and you haven't read one for a year and you immediately know where you were and what you were doing and what the story was doing. And he's just so clever at, at subtly just um, bringing back your memories of, of where you are in the story and what's happened without being obvious. You know, there are so many obvious oh, ways of doing interesting. that. Interesting. Do you think that's helped because of the pictures? Because, I mean, it's yes. an amazing visual journey apart from... Yeah. It's, the artwork is, is just stunning. And I've, I've been lucky enough to see it in his house as well, the originals. And like, like any great artwork, um, when you see the originals, the colours are just so intense and so vibrant and the pictures kind of draw you in. Um, in, a, in a way that they don't when they're reproduced. Um, I, although it's fascinating, isn't it? Sorry, Sam, go ahead. No, go on. I was, I was going because when we were uh, we were both over there for the um, Nightbreed um, screening, uh -huh. um, I would, was fortunate enough to be taken around by Thomas, uh, who's in charge of the um, archiving of all these photographs uh -huh. and the photographing, and they were sh he was showing me um, what they're doing with the and the camera that it takes, and you know, how much time it takes, and like nine hours a picture or something, it's ridiculous. It takes ages to do one of these things, because they are so careful with the color correction to make uh -huh. sure it's absolutely as perfect as possible. It's one of the uh -huh. prints that I was referring to at the very beginning, is one of the prints that's been given, uh, donated to the Borley Rectory project. Um, and it's absolutely fun. I don't, I, I've seen, I remember Clive painting some of them years and years ago. Um, and you've probably seen more of them than I have. They're just extraordinary, and they're so big. I think that's the that's uh, that's the thing you really can't get uh, across. Uh, especially the lands of Aberat, the triptych, um, is, mm. is is enormous, um, with all the different islands and things on it. It's it's three huge canvases. Yeah. And even in his studio, look huge, and his studio is enormous. I I um, it, it's interesting because I was looking because I know there have been photographs put up online of the actual original canvases um, uh -huh. and I was looking for those rather than just the single one, you know, just the single one, uh, which I got off Clive Barker in, uh, info .com. Um, it Yeah, no, I, yes, it's an it's absolutely extraordinary thing. Um, and as you say, just wonderful story and I love his, I love the names and yeah, that whole opening sequence and the standing at the edge before she goes into the world and the you know the, the town she comes from and uh, it's wonderful absolutely beautiful I've listened to um, I haven't read them recently but I've listened to the audible books uh, the uh -huh. audio books beautifully uh -huh. narrated I can't remember who the gentleman is um, but uh, yeah it, you do need to you do want to sit just sit down I'm gonna yeah, take one off my shelf. Um, oh, that's a good idea, actually. I haven't got the audio books. That would be, I, I told Clive I'd like to play Malingo when the films are made. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't realise, I mean, this was after the first book, so I didn't really quite realise then just what an enormous part that would be. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because <laughs> in the first book, you know, he doesn't appear till halfway through, and then you say, oh, that's a nice character, I could play that. But then, uh, of course, he seems to be one of the main characters in the, well, in the story. Shouldn't be a reason for stopping you. Yeah? Shouldn't be a reason for stopping you at all. All right. Well, so Aberat, uh, all five yep. volumes. Um, yeah. Uh, including number four, which hopefully is coming out. I don't know. I've not got a date as to when number four is coming out. Four, four should be out soon. Um, and yes. Five's finished it, um, and it's with the editors at the moment. Yeah. Um, so. yeah, hopefully. Cool, 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 cool. All right, then, so your next one, funnily enough, we're talking about the, the complete... complete... Yes. Works of William Shakespeare. Yes. Yes. Um, Similar to the Citizen Kane, really. I, mean, I know some of the Shakespeare plays. It's terrible for that to say. I don't know all of them, but I don't know all of them. Um, I did some obscure ones when we were at drama school. I did some of Cymbeline, which I'd never heard of. Um, we actually, we we did, you did some of Cymbeline where you appeared out of a box. Oh, you're or, right. Yeah, you're right. Or a yeah, case. That's right. And... The reason I remember this so vividly is because Craig and I went to the Royal Shakespeare Company to see Cymbeline. I thought, I've known nothing about this play until one of the characters came out of a box. I'm thinking, Simon did this. I swear Simon did this. <laughs> That's right, in her bedroom. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's very, it's very creepy. And I remember you coming out of there, that box and it being very creepy. <laughs> we did it. We did uh, it. Kind story, of a, story of my life. It, it, it <laughs> is, isn't it? Yeah, because I remember we did, this was because we did an evening of extracts from Shakespeare. And were you in the one with me where it was set in a circus? Oh, I don't, I don't remember. Oh, it was. Uh, yeah, no, it was, it was, I remember it was. It was fascinating. Actually, this brings me to one of the questions that's been asked by um, Steve from uh, Australia, which if Steve I could. Steve Dillon. Go. Steve Dillon, in fact, I'm going to select the Steve Dillon. He says, funnily enough, a lot of people choose the complete works of Shakespeare for their afterlife companion, and I believed you have performed some. But which one would you choose if you could only take one, and why? Ah, oh, that's a difficult one. That's a difficult one. Um, oh, oh, ooh. Um, uh, probably King Lear, because uh, it had a huge experience. King King Lear is the reason that I'm here chatting to you, mm -hmm. um, because King Lear is the one that Clive saw me in when we were at drama school. We did a production of it, and he came to see me and liked what I was doing. And, and funnily enough, I was very lucky there because um, the director we had had just done King Lear at the RSC, and he played the fool. And I was playing the fool in this production at drama school, so he knew my character inside out, back to front, um, everything about it. So I, I got an awful lot of extra direction from him, and and managed to pick his brain about all sorts of things. So I was kind of I was very lucky. Um, it, <laughs> funnily, and I was really proud of of what we did, what uh, and then my performance in that production. And then uh, they always have like um. And after they talk about the, the the tutors at drama school talk about mm. the production and they what they liked and what they don't. I can't always do an autopsy. This this was an autopsy anyway. They hated it. They tore us to shreds. Um, and the poor old guy who was playing King Lear. I mean, he he, he was twenty. Um, yeah. Steve. Uh, what was his name? What was his name? Huge, tall chap, blonde hair. Ah. Anyway. Um, it, it was it was unfair that you know they were criticising him. He was twenty, got no life experience apart from that of a twenty-year-old. Certainly not of a seventy or eighty-year-old who was going slightly mad with three daughters in the kingdom. Um, so I felt very sorry for him. Um, but anyway, uh, I dig I digress. And uh, the, Clive saw me in that, and it was because of that that we became friends, and we ended up in the the the, the dog company and the and, and Hellraiser and everything else. So King Lear, I owe a lot to King Lear. Um, and that's another reason I've chosen the complete works of Shakespeare, although I also was lucky enough a couple of years, two or three years ago, to do the complete works of Shakespeare abridged. Oh, yes. Uh, on an international tour. And that was so much fun. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was hilarious. I got to play, um, uh, I got to play Ophelia. Um, I got to play all sorts of, of, of Shakespearean characters. Gertrude. Um, 
we did a version of the whole. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but it is very, very funny. It, it's it's basically a piss take of Shakespeare. Um, and the second act is all Hamlet, and they they try and do these three guys who pretend that they know loads about Shakespeare, and obviously don't know very little at all. They try and do Hamlet in twenty minutes, um, and then they realise halfway through we we were doing a we were on tour internationally, and we were doing a production in Cairo, and uh, I sat down at the table because um, it was a dinner theatre. Um, after they'd finished eating, the, the, the our director had been sitting chatting with them and. And then uh, he got up so I could sit there because I was a stooge when the production started. And um, so I sat down at the table and it was all the heads of industry, very, very posh event. And uh, I was at the top table. So it was the, the very, very top heads of industry in Cairo. Um, and this one chap leant forward, very dapperly dressed, very smart. and said, oh, hello, I've seen you uh, at the table before. Are you, are you one of the actors? And I, said, I looked at him, I said, well, yes, I, uh, I am. But now I've told you that, I am going to have to kill you. And uh, everybody else around the table, dressed very smartly, they all went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> was this intake of breath. I went, oh, strange. Uh, anyway, the, the, the dapperly dressed chap went forward and went, oh. <laughs> oh, I think killing's a little severe. Maybe, maybe you could just cut out my tongue. I said, yeah, yeah, we, we, we could do that. Yeah, we could do that. And uh, and then everybody laughed around the table, and that was fine. And then, uh, anyway, we did the first act, and I got off stage, got off stage. And uh, in the in the first act, there was one woman in the audience quite drunk, but we'll get to her in a minute. And, and uh, the, the director came back, and uh, he said, uh, hmm, I, said, yeah, I don't know if it was going well. Um, the beginning, Simon, you, uh, you threatened to kill the Prince of Egypt. <laughs> I went, oh, oh, uh, so, uh, so oh, anyway, he seemed to be enjoying the show, and uh, second act, we uh, we got on, we had started to do the Hamlet in 20 minutes, and as part of it, uh, they realised that um, there's not enough with just three of them to play all the characters, so the other two um, actors decide that they will pick somebody in the audience to play Ophelia. Well, my character is very unhappy about this because he's been studying Ophelia and uh, is really not happy that they were going to pick some bimbo from the audience to play her. So we'd already decided amongst ourselves that it would be this woman who was slightly drunk and quite loud. So we start picking on her. The other two kind of persuading her to come up, being very nice to her, and my character being absolutely horrible to her, calling, also, calling her a bimbo to her face and, and being thoroughly nasty to her and making her life really hell, actually. And uh, <laughs> we got to the end, and the director came back and said, "Oh, that was nice. Yeah, it went down really well. Um, that lady you picked on—that was the uh, the prince's cousin." <laughs> <laughs> so, in one performance, I've been very, very rude um, to two members of the Egyptian royal family, and uh, but they did make, let me leave the country. I still have both my hands, which is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> and they let me in again, actually, for another production. So yeah, yeah, it was uh, that was good. good. So I have a yeah, yeah, have good. A yeah, no, Shakespeare, no. Shakespeare. It's not uh, mine. They're not the normal actors' tales of Shakespeare, but I've always had a load of fun with him. <laughs> and like Clive, I, I've always said Clive Barker is very similar to Shakespeare, and that everything he writes, everything he does, is incredibly intelligent. There's always mm -hmm. other reasons behind it. Nothing's ever just on the level. There are always lots and lots of levels to yeah work. yeah no absolutely I, i'm a great fan of shakespeare as well and clive um, <laughs> um we're going to move on to your third book and i thought this choice was absolutely fascinating <laughs> okay. so you're uh, i have it here yeah roast figs sugar snow can you read out the subtitle yes. for us oh it's backwards is it backwards in your screen um just on your screen it's fine okay it's it's just... Yes, Roast Figs, Sugar Snow by Diana Henry, and it's food to warm the soul. Um, and it's, she, Diana Henry, I think she was the food critic for the Sunday Times. I can't remember, but it's, I've never cooked anything that she's, any recipe she's done without it being completely fantastic. Her food is just pumpkin tarts with spinach and gorgonzola. Uh, roast figs and plums in vodka with cardamom cream. Uh, steam apple and marmalade pudding. 
uh, oh, it's just the food is just seared scallops with bacon and Jerusalem artichoke puree. Uh, I could just go on and on. Russian partridge with beetroot and sour cream. You do have to go to Russia for that one. Or Austrian <laughs> rabbit, which is a bit closer for us to Austria. It's not so good for Steve Dillon in Australia. Um, just, I highly recommend it. Anything by Diana Henry, any cookbook. And the reason I pick it is because I'm a middle-aged man, and uh, unlike most middle-aged men, I'm food obsessed. So, yeah, food. I can't get enough of it. Oh, but I know what to get Craig for his Christmas present. Oh, <laughs> I, you, won't, you won't be disappointed. <laughs> I don't do cooking, so although I could, oh, I, I could try. I could try doing this cooking. That sounds wonderful. All right then. Um, cool. <laughs> we'll move on to you. <laughs> no one's ever chosen a, 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 a recipe book before. A I think that's brilliant. A cookbook. <laughs> I think it's brilliant. We'll have to give you a little primer stove to go. You know, an endless supply of food. Yeah. Just in case, <laughs> yeah, just absolutely. so you can enjoy your enjoy it. I, yes, except of course this is all going to be for the aliens. But perhaps we should leave yeah. them with. Hermetically sealed of... ingredients, because they won't yes. be able to find any Russian partridges and so on. So we're going to leave them with. Yeah, well, I'll arrange that. They'll have hermetically. Maybe sealed. a freezer. A freezer, a, freezer. a perpetual, eternal supply of electricity. A solar, and... solar energy panels yeah. above it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because so they can make the recipes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay, so your next. Uh, section is on plays and musicals. You chose anything by Stephen Sondheim, though if forced to choose one, he now gives me four, Merrily We Roll Along, or Sunday in the Park with George, or Pacific Overtures, or Into the Woods. Right. <laughs> or Assassins, or, or um, Company. Oh, He's company. just a genius. I love genius. Don't you just love genius? And Stephen I, I, Sondheim is... He's, he's so pretty, he's clever. He's so clever, so wonderful. Um, when I was on the lo on the flight uh, on our flight to the USA the last time, they were doing a documentary on his life and his works. I think it's absolutely fascinating. Absolutely uh -huh. I think I saw it. I saw it. Yeah, it's yeah, brilliant. No, he's he's a he's a great one at just touching the human condition at just. But, but again, not doing it in an obvious way, not doing it in a manipulative way, but just, I, I don't know how he does it, but he's so aware of the human condition. And, and as an actor, I think that, that really fascinates me, that what makes us human, what actually moves us, the way that we actually feel and actually, and, and it's, we're so easily, these days television um, becomes so episodic, so the, the formatic. Mm. So, so that like Little House on the Prairie, you know, it's uh, it becomes the same format week in week out, and then they find a new format, and for a while that's really exciting, and then everybody uses that format, and and and, and it's just a way of they found a way of manipulating our moods and our senses, and our and but Sondheim doesn't do that, he doesn't he doesn't make it easy for himself, he always takes the difficult route, and as such, um, touches bits of the human condition which. A rarely, rarely, t a really subtle, um, mm. but a very, very much part of of who we are, and and I just, I just love his work. Merrily, we, merrily we run along. It's about drama students, um, and works backwards. Uh, so it starts, it starts um, at, at a, an Oscar award ceremony when they're all in their forties, fifties, and one of them's winning an award, and then it works backwards in time. And ends when they're all drama students standing on a on a building um, on a roof, about to graduate, looking forward with great optimism and, and youth and and excitement about the wonderful adventure they're about to go on. And it's it's kind of depressing actually because because it, it, it starts at the end when they're kind of bitter and cynical and and it goes back kind of uh, what's made them into these people into and it starts where they're just full of life and energy and 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 it makes you think why why do we go on those journeys and it, it's actually made me think i don't if i can avoid those traps i don't want to be a grumpy old man and i i see people around me getting there and i see it i see it you know i feel it within myself mm -hmm. um the intolerance of life and and all the things that just uh, make life it, not not as pleasant. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And the thing you see, and, and also you, re, you, have, you have a more realis, a realization of what's possible and what's not possible and, and what's a dream and what's, what's achievable. Um, plus you see yourself getting old. <laughs> Tell me about it. I know how you feel. <laughs> I remember having hair once. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll be bringing that to mind. <laughs> so yes, yeah, Sondheim, 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 he's a genius, I love him. He's not easy, again, he's, it's a bit like Terence Malick, it's not easy, um, uh, uh, Sunday in the Park with George, once you've listened to it ten times, it's fantastic, but the mm. first time you, you hear it, and he goes, red, 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 orange, and a blue, green, blue, green, blue, green, he's like, what? What? Are you serious? You know, this I, is not even a tune. Yeah. I know. I, I, I fell enough. Barbara Streisand did a version of putting it all together, and I think it is one of the best songs about creativity and the process of creativity, uh -huh. bit by bit, putting it together. Um, and I, I, very, very good. I, Into the Woods. I, was, I cried at the trailer they showed the other day. Oh, um, I know. You know <laughs> Christmas Day. And, they're releasing it Christmas Day, I believe. In America, we don't get it's it until here. a week later. Oh. We, do, I think it's, it's like. What? What are you doing? Will you stop doing It's like, I think it's the 7th of January or something like that, uh, so a couple of weeks later. Um, but it was Clive who introduced me to Into the Park, um, Into the Woods. Uh, Clive introduced me to Sondheim too. Yeah. Uh, I don't know yeah. if it was Into the Woods, but I can't remember what the song was. I can't remember. That's, um, he introduced I mean, me to Sondheim, yeah. But it was interesting because we're it it moving from Sondheim to, one of it, to a collaborator with Sondheim. Mm -hmm. uh, which is Leonard Bernstein. Bernstein, yeah, uh, and Condide again. Uh, uh, I was I was lucky enough to do. Uh, um, I was really, really, really lucky that I did this show in uh, Vienna, and it was a farce. And I, I did three months in Vienna at the English speaking theatre there. I had the most amazing part of this little vicar. It was called See How They Run. Was the farce, and I played this vicar. Um, who everybody talked about all the way through the, uh, the the play, but I actually only came on in the last 15 minutes and completely got all the laughs, stole all the scenes, because the audience knew me, because everybody had been talking about me for two and a half hours, and then I came on and <laughs> just kind of cleaned up. It was wonderful. <laughs> so basically, I was working for 15 minutes a day. That was it. You know? I mean, and, and for that, I was getting paid to go and live in Vienna for three months. I'm not jealous was, at all. It was just, you know, <laughs> you couldn't make that up because it was fantastic. It's like, yes, please. Even the rehearsals were easy. Um, so, yes, and when I was there, they had a huge Bernstein festival on. And they had on the Rat House Park, the town hall, they had this incredible sc huge screen. And they were showing Bernstein themed pieces every night. So after I finished work, I would go and sit, and it was free. Um, in the Rat House Park and look at uh, what they were showing. And they had a big orchestra there as well that was kind of playing along. And, and that's where I first came across Condide, um, which is the most extraordinary piece of work. Do you know it? I've, I've heard bits of it. I had a mate of mine do it. Um, I don't know if he was with the, the RSC at the time. Um, but he, he yeah, I, I've heard bits of it. Um, and it's Bernstein. I love Bernstein. Um, uh -huh. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. Again, it's it's about the search. It's about the search for the meaning of life. It's about so it's about what makes us happy, what makes us human. Um, it, and again, it's very surreal. Yeah. Um, well, the original book. I've read the original. I've read the original book. Uh -huh. And Frank Finley did a BBC version of it where he um, where he plays um, Voltaire. Uh -huh. um, and it has one of my favourite philosophies, the Panglossian theory of life. Everything is perfect in the best of all possible worlds. God created the world. God is perfect. Therefore, he created a perfect world. Therefore, everything is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. I love that idea. <laughs> not sure. I love the idea. I'm not sure if it's true. But it's, it's like, it's a way of looking. It's like, it's fine. It, you know, everything's for the best. It's a great it's attitude, got one. Does the, does the book have the woman with one buttock as well? Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, my understanding is it's very faithful to the book. The book itself uh -huh. is bizarre, uh, and the BBC version, as I say, with Frank Finley, 
uh, in it was is is it's bizarre because they kind of did it as a stage show, but with little bits of animation and puppetry and and so on. And uh, I, yeah, I love Condeed. I, I love Condeed. I was lucky enough um, just before they closed. The Liverpool Everyman did a production of it, which I was lucky enough to see um, on tour. And uh, and to that day, I've I've been a fan of Condeed. I think it's just work of genius. It really is. So again, highly recommended. Get a cool. chance to go and see it. Cool. Right, we'll move on to the next one. Um, I have to just give a shout out for Craig, who's working really hard in the background preparing all these slides for me and making sure they're all nicely timed up for me. This next one is The Life and Adventures of Nicholas Nickleby, um, Royal Shakespeare Company production, starring Roger Rees. Yes, a very young Roger Rees. Mm. And uh, uh, um, Smike, who was playing Smike? Uh, David Threlfall. Oh, did, oh, he was superb. He he came on as Smike. He said about three words, and you just wanted to weep. He was just a genius performance. Um, the production did again. Did you see it? Nick? I've seen I've seen the TV version. I didn't see it in the theatre. I couldn't get a ticket. Oh. Um, no, I didn't get it. I saw the TV version. I, I would have loved to have seen it. Yeah. But it was done over three. It was in three parts. And I think each part was was three. It's eight and a half long. hour long. Eight and a, it was done as four parts in the TV series. It's eight and a half hours, and I think right. it was three, three parts of three hours each on yeah, stage. Yeah, that's right. Um, and like, just the most wonderful, wonderful, wonderful production. Um, very clever use of staging, and then the the most incredible cast, who've nearly all, without doubt, all gone on to do incredible work. Um, in film and television and theatre, uh, just it's the kind of work as an actor you watch and you think, oh, that you know, if I could ever be part of something that brilliant and that good, um, I think it's something like I would, I would die happy. I think it's like 40 actors playing 151 different parts. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's, I was looking at the stats of it this afternoon and I was doing research. It's just extraordinary. But you're absolutely, and to be honest, I think. I kind of watched it all the way through because I think it was only recently that I heard it on radio and heard the whole thing dramatized and just thought, wow, that is a killer ending. That <laughs> the way he ties up, Dickens ties up the whole ending. And what is revealed is just amazing. Absolutely yeah. super, really, really yeah. fascinating yeah. stuff. Dickens again. Dickens again. I, no, I, I hope. But one day Clive is seen as a Dickens and a, and a Shakespeare, and he's kind of appreciated in that way. I don't think he quite is yet, but I hope he is one day. I, I can I can see what you, you mean because there, again, it's just these. I mean, Dickens was a social. Yeah. You know, his, his stuff was social commentary. Um, <laughs> but and he published. drew these amazing characters. Oh, absolutely, and they created these amazing characters which actors love to play. Um, because they are so amazing and they speak in such fantastical voices and uh, but are terribly terribly human um, it was one of the first things when I was an amateur about 11 years old it was one of the first things I did would play all the boy parts in Dickens in a Dickensian evening um, that was put on by an amateur society so yeah I, I know it's uh, extraordinary absolutely extraordinary I, I, I did one of the first jobs I did at a drama school um, after after the dog company was I think it was a uh, young David Copperfield no, it was with a terrible, terrible agent called. Oh, what's his name? Who's the agent we all joined? And he was. Terrible. I think you did. I didn't. You didn't want me. <laughs> <laughs> he had some taste. Oh, what's his name? What was his name? Oh, my brain. Anyway, he did a production of Young David Copperfield, and I played Young David Copperfield. He cast me. Um, every place it was a tour, and uh, the girl playing my love interest, they cast in each place we went to. Well, she was only 14. So th there was me, 21, doing these love scenes every week with a different 14-year-old. <laughs> it was terrible. It was wrong on so many levels. <laughs> we got to, the end, we got to the, the end of Act 1, and um, we had... Uh, he'd... Oh, I'm going to have to remember his name. Um, he'd, he'd, on the cheap, he'd managed to get this puppet, this UV puppet company. So at the end of Act 1, we'd be sitting down next to the sea and I'd be talking to my this young girl and say, I wonder what it's like under the sea there. And then 
God, you know, it makes me cringe. Suddenly, there'd be this music come along, bobbing along on the bottom of the beautiful briny sea. <laughs> it, was, it, it would go from being this kind of serious musical version of Dickens into a UV puppet show. It was, it was awful. It was truly, truly, truly awful. Just, oh. <laughs> oh, one day I'll tell you about the musical Leonardo. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we we had a week's rehearsal. We got the costumes like ten minutes before we went on. None of it fitted. So I, I remember my opening night. Everybody dried. I was very very keen young actor. I knew everybody's lines as well as my own. So everybody dried but me, and I managed to get everybody out of their their pickles. Um, but my trousers were constantly falling down because they were like five sizes too big, and they hadn't got a belt. So I was the whole thing, like doing this, trying to lift trousers up because they were falling down. Oh, oh it was, it was terrible, terrible. No, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to hurry you along now because it's ten okay. to. I knew this one was gonna overrun. I, you know, we will get to as many of the questions, guys, who've, who, who've kindly logged questions. We'll, we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. This is gonna go on until about quarter past twenty past, I suspect. Um, it always does. I don't know why I think it's gonna last an hour. Um, right, and. This is your favourite, actually no, a piece of furniture. You're, we don't have a photograph of this answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, my, my handmade carved wood bed. Uh, I'll, it, as a kid, I, I just love sleep. Don't you? I love sleep. And as a kid, my mum mom said the difference between me and my brother was that my brother was always trying to stay awake and wouldn't want to go to bed. And me, I'd be saying, oh, can I go to bed? Is it bedtime yet? Can I go to bed? I'm tired. Uh, so yeah, I I, uh, I love sleep. I know I know I know I know all the things that you know we've only got this limited amount of time and stuff. But I never have enough energy. So uh, I uh, you're talking to, to a ma yeah. That's, that I'm I will often sleep for a couple of hours during the day, and the yeah. dog will come and curl up with me and kick me out the way when he decides to get uncomfortable. And uh, yeah. Crisp, yeah, crisp Egyptian cotton sheets. Yeah. Freshly laundered, oh, I just can't be beaten. And it never, yep. you never. I mean, we, we we go away together quite a bit, you and I, Nick. And it's never the same. However, however good the hotel is, it's never quite the same as no. your own bed. No, no, there is something. Yeah, no. The, the, at the end of a long, you know, the last trip was a long one, and it's just like I just want to be home. I just want to be in my bed, just curled up I, with a good book. When I, and, yeah. when I tour in England, I always tour my own pillows. My sister bought me some really lovely goose down pillows, um, so I always tore those. But you can't really take those abroad. So no, 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 they take it. Yeah, no, I, I'm so I have favourite pillows, and it's like yeah, yeah. All right, well, the next one is going to is your favourite food, and yep. this is aubergine parmigiana. Um, oh, parmigiana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've never I've, had this. Well, I've never come across this. No, oh, I, hey. I'm not a big fan oh. of aubergine. Ah, oh, okay. Well, it doesn't taste that much. It's a lot, but I love aubergine. Aubergine is my favourite vegetable, and uh, I, I could easily be a vegetarian um, if I didn't know so many meat eaters. Um, <laughs> I was for 17 years. It's yeah. it's quite a struggle. Yeah. I, I love aubergine, and I love uh, that lovely rich tomato sauce that you can that the Italians make. And then you just cover that with some parmesan, and you've got basically you've got aubergine parmigiana, and oh, it's just, it's one of those matches of foods that work just perfectly together. Now I'm trying to think what the American eggplant is. The American eggplant, yeah, eggplant is American. Yeah. No, I think is the the fact that you have to wash it and press it and cover it in salt to get rid of all the poisons in aubergine. No, it's, it's, it's bitter. It's not poisons. It's just bitterness. Um, right. A, a lot of the modern chefs don't bother with all of that um, salting it Ooh. and letting all the juices come out and stuff. I mean, you wash the salt off. You don't keep the salt on there. No, it's, it's um, the bitterness. I remember my mother preparing it and not doing any of that. And it, was just, it burned my mouth. And I think, <laughs> having said this, I remember mazaka is one of my favourite dishes. Yeah, you see, again, again, aubergine. I love aubergine. And also, uh, when I first started cooking, of course, you fry aubergine. And mm. it's like a sponge. So if you fry it in olive oil, it just soaks up all this... Um, oil and stuff and again you don't need to do that if you just kind of do it on a griddle or something then it, it still makes it nice and crisp and everything else but without the six gallons of olive oil that you <laughs> okay 
All right. Okay. We should, I, I, I shall. I shall. I shall. We'll, we'll try it. Aubergine well, I, haven't, I haven't found a Diana Henry recipe, but it doesn't really need one. There are loads of recipes out there. Uh, this one came from Jamie Oliver when I found the, and he there said it, it, it says easy, extremely easy to cook, and I thought, oh, well, I probably can probably do that one in that <laughs> case. So I can try that one for. Okay, and um, we'll move on to our next one. Um, if uh, and that's uh, <laughs> officially, it's comic or graphic novel. <laughs> I love these two as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I've never really got into that. Uh, 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 Mark um, Miller, when I was yeah. over in the states recently, showed me um, one of the new comic graphic novels, and they have these interactive ones these days. Made so fire. Kind of just they've just done they've just done books of blood. Oh, they're doing books of blood. They just started books That's of right. blood. Made fire. He was fire. showing me bits. Wonderful bits of it and it's incredible and it's best designed for an iPad or something and yeah oh it's just incredible um so yeah so I chose the Beano <laughs> <laughs> because... have... oh, sorry to interrupt you Simon because I don't know I was very specific about the cover of the dandy that I found it had to be desperate Dan and he had to be eating cow pie cow pie, yeah, pie. Yeah, Eat... yeah 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 eating cow pie it's just <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with these comics. Uh, I always used to get the the Christmas annuals at Christmas, you know, the special editions. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And yeah. I loved them. And I don't think, for me, they won't be beaten. You know, I, I suppose you know things that you grew up with in your childhood are really special to you and very personal to you. Um, one of them, I believe, doesn't exist anymore. Is it the Beano that's gone, or the Dandy? Or did one they? One of them's or, online. Or did they integrate? Right. I'm not sure. I think one of them's different. I would say that kids today are probably way too sophisticated yeah. for that. I, 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 I don't. Having said that, I you know there's cartoon versions of um, uh, Dennis the Menace. Now this is the English Dennis the Menace, not the American Dennis the Menace. Um, there are different things, but there is definitely a cartoon version of this version of Dennis the Menace, the English version of Dennis the Menace with Nasher his, jo his dog. I love the fact when I looked at, I'd forgotten this entirely. When I, you can't really see it here, but in the bottom right-hand corner of both of these, it says basically continues on back cover. Um, you always to get these um, big things on the front cover, and then the actual story was on the back cover, the outside back cover oh, yeah. of the comic. <laughs> I, I used to love, used to get free things with them as well. They used, they used to have uh, things like, um, uh, it was a folded piece of paper and you used to go like that and you go thwack and it was supposed yes. to make like a thundercrack sound. Yes, it didn't yeah, yeah, yeah. Went, thwack. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or no, plastic, plast, plastic cut out guns where you could put a rubber band on it and, f and flick it at people and pull it yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not old at all. Um, <laughs> Right. We're so not, move... not very sophisticated, I'm afraid. Not very I'm sophisticated. No, no. Not at all <laughs> sophisticated. Yeah, you, you, all these people watching, many of them are just like, what are they talking about? What you know? Yeah. Should they watch TV and the internet? We didn't have them. They didn't exist in those days. <laughs> TV internet. Well, so, no, didn't. TV didn't. I mean, I remember when we first. Oh God, this does make me feel old. I remember when we got first got our TV, and I remember when we first got our color TV because we we held out a long time for that. Um, 1972, when the VAT went down, on that's when we got our color TV. I, I remember, as as a as a young kid, we used to have a thing called Listen with Mother, which was before we had a TV, and used to sit Absolutely. there was time on on radio, uh, and you'd sit and there would be a time called Listen with Mother, and they'd you'd sit with your mother and you'd your mother and 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 it started and it, and it started every time every time. Are you sitting comfortably? Then yeah, I'll begin. <laughs> <laughs> I get goosebumps as I say that because it's like. <laughs> I seem to remember we used to, both me and my mum used to go, yes. <laughs> yeah. well, and, and of course, when they did have TV, then it was the wooden tops with the biggest spotty dog in all oh, the yes. world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and the Bill and Ben. And sorry, this is, we're going off a complete tangent. This yes. is going to come on. I did, I did a fifth production um, for a, uh, written by a comedian called Richard Digence. And uh -huh. the play was called Sex, Bangles, and Sensible Shoes. And it was basically about... Uh, I played this young guy who shared a flat with these two older guys, and they spent uh, the two older guys spent all their time 
talking about Sex Bangles, reminiscing about things from their past and how wonderful. And my character um, was like just being driven crazy by the, by this and wanted to live life for now and not for the past. But, um, yeah, so <laughs> all those things. That's right. Well, we've just lost one viewer, so. Ah! <laughs> We've got, it's right, we've got more than the one we started with. Um, right, I'm going to go on to the... <laughs> Moving quickly on. Moving quickly on. These are your apps that, or your games. Um, on the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, yes. Plants, uh, versus, plants versus zombies. Brains. Brains. <laughs> Have you played it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got through oh, all the addictive. levels. And it's like, yeah, and it's Have you just, played number two? I Plants vs. Zombies 2 now, where they goes off to Egypt and places as well. Oh, yeah, I think I, I might have done. I might have done. I'm, so, all, I'm, I'm very bad at getting addicted to these things, and, and, and I keep playing them and keep playing them. The same with the creeps. Um, the, 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 sorry, let me just bring the creeps up again for everybody. This is where, protect the boy from his nightmares. I've never yeah, come across the creeps. The this creeps is, is very similar to Plants vs. Zombies. There's a little boy asleep at the end of the, like, the maze thing. Mm -hmm. um, and out of this door comes all these nightmare characters, and your job is to try and use things around the room to to stop them from reaching the boy and and and, and giving him nightmares. Obviously, it gets it gets more and more difficult to do, and you can collect things and you have to destroy things as well. But basically, the concept is you protect this boy from having a nightmare. So it's it's. It's oh, such a time waster. Like, <laughs> and what what do you have to do in The Simpsons? I think I've got a screen grab of the. the oh, The Simpsons is even worse. It's, um, <laughs> tap, tapping out or something. I, I played that and I got very addicted to that and very addicted to Ice Age Village, and they're both the same concept in that you start off with nothing. You start off with like oh, uh, the the concept of The Simpsons. The beginning of it is that he's blown it up in the nuclear. Home has blown up where right. I live in a, in a nuclear Springfield. explosion, and so you have to start rebuilding it from from scratch. Um, and so you start very smallly building houses. It's 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 a Sims game, basically. Okay. Um, creating society, building society. Um, it gets more complicated as 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 you go through it. Um, but there's no end to it. And the okay. same in Ice Age Village, it just gets bigger and bigger. You, your your city gets more, bigger and bigger and more and more complicated, and you get more and more addicted and spend more and more time. And it's very, I don't know about anybody else, but I, I, my um, sister in law, my brother's uh, uh, wife, was very, very addicted to Ice Age Village. And, and it's very difficult to say, okay, enough. <laughs> <laughs> You feel like you're killing all these people that you because you're kind of playing God. You feel like you're just kind of you're going to end it all for them. It's just wrong. <laughs> I, I just don't. I, I deleted all the all the games from my iPad because I realised that I was just doing nothing but they're time -wasting. killing they're zombies. Terrible, they're terrible completely. Time I mean, they're fascinating, and I, I you know, and I completely respect some of the more sophisticated games and, and are, are yeah, but. Yeah, no, I'll move on. Right, so we're going to move on to um, the next one. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please, Cly uh, Craig. Oh, <laughs> Sorry, I had to wake up my glamorous assistant in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't the one who left, was he? No. <laughs> <laughs> Craig is very dutifully sitting in the other room with the dog on a very comfortable bed. And I'm quite convinced if we go on too long, he'll just doze off. <laughs> He's going to go down oh. and make dinner soon. Yeah. Um, the triptych. There the it triptych. Is. Yeah. Sorry, I, I couldn't get a bigger the joints one. There at all. No, it's, as I say, I was wanting to get the you know the really big one, but. Uh huh. Yeah. It and, is and, extraordinary. Clive, so uh, art uh, would Clive's triptych of the islands of Aberat. The the colours, the detail, it just it's extraordinary. And like I said before. They are enormous, these things. They're yeah. just vast pieces of artwork. Um, beautiful, just breathtaking. You could stand and look at them for hours. It, it's, um, I mean, it's the amount of paint he puts into them as well. Uh, it's just that, you know, he, he must keep yes. art supply stores in. In fact, yeah. when we were over there, I remember talking to the lads who work with him and 
one thing, you know, talking about the fact he got really excited because he found a new paper to give to Clive, and Clive was uh-huh. excited about that as well. Because um, it's, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to tell that story because we don't have time. I'll tell another story at another time. But yeah, <laughs> okay, so the Aberrant. Um, just because we're five past eight, we'll move on to the next one, if I may. Um, I'm waiting for my. Uh, the next one is. Uh, yes, the next one is going to be. More about the aliens. I think uh, Craig may be having difficulty getting the next slide up by the looks of it. Um, but just, there it oh, is. There uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Now this one, I think we probably want to spend a little time on. Um, I should uh, just explain something to you, perhaps to you, but definitely to the viewers. The image in the white rectangle is the image that was originally published that oh, right. went around the world. Uh-huh. The larger image is the uncropped image. And what you can see at the right hand side, the, the soldier is looking at his camera, uh-huh. is dealing with his camera. But uh, what, uh, you and I know this picture. This I'm going to leave it up whilst we talk about it for a bit, actually, uh-huh. just so people can um, have a look at it and like, try and understand. Tell us about it, Simon. What is it we're actually looking at? It's, to, to my knowledge, it's uh, it's the Vietnam and um, the village had been napalmed, and the little mm-hmm. girl running towards us. She'd lost everything, and then she also her skin was kind of covered in napalm as well, I believe, so she was in absolute agony. I mean, just look at their faces. I, and, and, and the art, especially photography, can change, can really change lives, change people's opinions, change the world. And this, this photograph, for me, just shows... I, I think this photograph must have been one of the key things that began to change people's opinions. Um, You're absolutely right in my research. She, she. It's her brother who's in front of her, uh, at, the, at the foreground. She received 30% burns, um, and it's only through the action of the photographer who took, who was a Vietnamese himself, um, who got her into a decent hospital. That she she was in hospital for like, something like 13 months. And every day they had to remove all the dead skin to begin with, and just and you know, countless. She's now living in Canada. She has two children. She's married, um, but this picture became. Uh, you're absolutely right. It did help change opinion of the of the of the Vietnam War in America, and um, and exactly what was going on, um, uh, as you know, and I think. People, will have, many people will have seen you know, the films um, inspired by it, but it's it's an incredibly moving story because, of course, she went back to her village afterwards, and the North Vietnamese, the communists, won the war, and she wanted to go away and study as a doctor, but she wasn't allowed to because they realised what a big publicity. Um, coup she was. So she was basically trotted out to all the visiting um, uh, reporters and journalists and her words were monitored. She had to keep to a script. So that picture haunted her uh, for years. Until eventually she got married and she was sent to Cuba as as a thank you. And then she got married and honeymooned in Moscow and then on the way back um, they they stopped off in Canada and they defected um, uh-huh. uh, in Canada. But as I say, now she married with two uh-huh. children. Uh, but extraordinary life. Absolutely an amazing life. But that, I think that that picture and there is a, uh, you may well remember if I try and describe it. There is a picture from the Second World War of a little boy in the foreground, a Jewish boy with his hands in the air. Um, if I can find this, I'll, 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 I'll display it to people with the, the Nazi shoulders, soldiers in the back short background, and I think it's the Warsaw Ghetto. It's another one of these. It's, it's children in war. Yes. Up here. Um, yeah. It's, and, but, and, I, I think also that this picture kind of um, it continues to have an effect because it, it's, it's also about kind of chemical warfare and. Um, I think we need to be re- reminded of, of chemical warfare and, and germ warfare and, and all the different ways, horrendous ways that 
that governments stockpile this terrible stuff mm. um, that can be used on civilians and is used on on civilians. Um, I, yeah. I think we need to be constantly made aware of that, and and this picture does that. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, your next choice um, in terms of um, art is the Sagrada de Fam I, Your Spanish may be better than mine. Sagrada de Familia. Yes. It's, oh, it's an extraordinary building. I'm, again, I'm not religious uh, at all, but um, it's uh, Gaudi started building this in Barcelona, and um, it's it's being an ongoing project. I don't. I don't know if it's finished yet. It doesn't look like it is. But it I, I don't think it is. I mean, the, the, obviously they use it and they can get inside, but I think, I mean, the, the real tragedy is that they, his original, des they can never finish it exactly as he designed it because his designs were destroyed in a fire. Right. Um, I, when I went there, you, you could go around and, and uh, the picture on the left, it's got these four tall towers. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the right two, there's like a tiny little bridge going between them. Uh -huh. you go up these incredibly tiny spiral staircases and then go over this little bridge, which, as I remember, it had no handrail. Uh, so it was there was a little thing that was about two feet high uh -huh. to stop you falling over the edge. And, and that was that little thing going between the two. And then you went and, and, and then you, when you looked at how it was built, there were... Uh, and and the, the, these pieces he Gaudi himself had done, there'd be um, a bit of old plate stuck in there, and then there'd be a sculpture of um, a sheep's head. There'd be things that he'd found uh, and thought were artistic or beautiful that he'd built in to the structure of the building. So it's 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 the only place I've had a real spiritual experience. You feel like the building is growing organically out of the earth. And it's just because of the extraordinary way that he's built it and the incredible detail that's in there that you really can't see. You kind of, if you look at the bottom, um, the main entrance there, that, that looks a bit like something that might have kind of evolved or grown out of the earth. Yes. But the, all of it has this incredible feeling to it. Um, just extraordinary. I've always wanted to, I've never actually got to Barcelona. It is the one thing, it is on the bucket list. And and oh. I know what you mean about the. I, again, I was looking for photographs. I couldn't because that's what I was immediately thought of was the thing, bits of broken plates in uh -huh. in the wall and so on. Just uh, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Okay, right. Well, we've got to your last question, um, which right. is what costume would you be buried in? And then we will quickly move on to the all the ones that have been logged by people. Um, <laughs> I couldn't believe you when you chose this one. This well, is the <laughs> they say that cloth kind of um, quite often. Uh, I, I was lucky to work in Cairo, as I said, and uh, you, you you quite often see um, on the, the the mummies and things that mm. their their clothes have outlived their flesh. So there's bits of, of there's quite often quite a lot of flat of clothes sure. and things and hair and stuff that has survived, whereas they haven't. So I said, well, Butterball's costume would be a good one to wear because there's loads of leather on there, so that would last a long, long time. Um, and a thick insulation of foam latex. So um, Keep you warm. Whether, they, whether the aliens would then actually know to, that, um, that there might be such somebody real inside of it all. Um, That's what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I love it. I, 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 when I was googling, it's like you can actually get dress-up costumes. So the one on the right is actually a um, is a is a Halloween costume that you can buy of like one hundred and eighty-nine dollars. Um, if you right. really, <laughs> you can get it, you get it. You can get chatter and so on. I love this idea um, that people would. You know, wonder, but he hasn't what, got the sunglasses. What, uh, what the aliens would make of it, I don't know, that we were a race of um, sadomasochistic... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, with the, with the little metal tools and so on. And <laughs> imagine if you, if, you know, like the entirety of humanity is summed up by Simon Bamford's tomb. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd probably think we were all born with this kind of big, big hole in our stomach. They wouldn't necessarily know that it was a wound, would they? <laughs> <laughs> of course, it were all melded and melted together by that stage. They think we were all blind. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that that makes perfect sense to me. And if that's what you want, Simon, that I'm absolutely here to give you. And I won't, you know, insist when they read out your will. <laughs> oh no, he said on my show, this is what he wants to be buried in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was quite insistent. Yeah, yeah, no, he was very clear on this fact. Yeah, yeah, no, I think your family is probably. Anyway, we'll move. <laughs> We're now going to move on to some questions. We've got quite a, a few here. I am, I'm going to choose as many, get through as many as I can, guys. And thank you for all your comments. Fernando's been cheerfully um, uh, uh, putting stuff in. Um, and I don't know why he's put in the word sex bang, um, but he has uh, some, for some reason, which I'm not quite. It was probably relevant when we were speaking, right? Okay, I'm going to choose. <laughs> I don't know. Um, okay, this is actually Vicky's. Uh, so I'm going to actually going to just select uh, Vicky's uh, uh, first one first, and I'll see if I can try and find her second one. Um, but the days of the dead in Indianapolis, you revealed to me that you had read the script for the upcoming Hellraiser reshoot, reboot. Does this mean that you will be working on the movie, whether it's behind the scenes or on camera? What can you tell us about the reboot? Um, I ha well, I haven't read the script, but I have talked to Clive about it, and he told me um, things about um, the characters and um, about how some of it would work. But I am, I'm, I'm afraid I'm completely... Uh, I'm not allowed to talk about any of it. That's all I can tell you is that I know some stuff, and it's fantastic, um, and dark and bleak and black and everything you'd expect from a Hellraiser reboot. Um, oh, brilliant! And, and very different, very different to to the Hellraiser that's out there. So, um, and whether I'd be involved, I don't know. I've loved told them that I'd like to be, and they've said they don't see any reason why not. But. Uh, but um, it's still very early days. I don't. I don't know how. I don't think they're. It keeps getting close Cl to production, and then it goes off the boil again. And uh, I like all these. I think Clive has finished the script, from what I understand. Yeah, or no, there is a it quite a while ago. Yeah. 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 So we don't know. Um, it's a question from Vicky. Other than sleeping, eating, and taking orders from their superiors, Le Leviathan, Pinhead, etc., how do you think Chatra and Possible would be spending their free time in the labyrinth? <laughs> <laughs> and and do you think they would be friends with Kinski and Anarka as well? <laughs> I love that question. <laughs> How do you think we spend our downtime? In well, you'd probably be you'd probably just be wandering around looking for your glasses. <laughs> I put them down somewhere. I know they're around here somewhere. <laughs> well, we were both kind of blind, weren't we? So. Yes. Yeah. I don't know, maybe listening to books. Maybe listening to yeah, um... yes. Yeah, we'd probably be listening to books, whether or not no, would they get there was a comic book crossover between Hellraiser and Nightbreed called Jihad. I don't know how they fared in that. Um Yeah. I'm not sure on that one, Vicky, is the honest honestly. Um I think Steve Mason asked, Would you like to play another Cenobite if given a chance? Um I'm assuming there would be Cenobites in a reboot of Hellraiser um, without mm. giving to... Oh, I don't know. Right, we'll move on from that one. Would, generally speaking... <laughs> I can't talk about that. I we do can't know, talk I do about know, that. But we I can't do know talk about that. that there will be Cenobites. Um, right. But I think we all see that. Very, 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 very different Cenobites. Well, that yeah. sounds very cool. That sounds excellent. Would we want to play them? Probably. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I Please. think we both said, yeah, we'd love to play. I'd love to play another Cenobite. <laughs> Great. And from what, from, what, from what I understand, there's no reason that we couldn't. No. Good. Well, that, that, that's us then. <laughs> I'll make sure Mark Miller sees this. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is our cast. Please, sir, could we be Cenobites? Um, again. But, again. Could I... Uh, this, is, um, this is from Steve Mason. Oh, sorry, we've done that one. It's the, the uh, next one is from Keith McGlynn. Uh, greetings from the west coast of Ireland, guys. Keith here sending you the very best wishes. Oh, hi, Keith. Quick. Hi, Keith. <laughs> um, Keith, uh, if you could go back and play just one character, which one, Simon? Butterball or Anarko? Nico, Chatterer or Kins Kinski? 
I think I'm going to be honest. It'll be kids. Why on earth would I put myself through the hell of basketball again? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, if the two, you know, do we get to play, well, in Kinski's case, really cool, sexy dude who the women absolutely love, according to the memes I keep on seeing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the ability to and speak. The fact, and the fact that it's now, I mean, that now that the, the director's cut is out there and it's finally after 25 years, you can see the film that we actually set out to make is, is just extraordinary and, and wonderful. And I just hope, more, hope enough people get to see the director's cut version. Oh, well, I mean, it's gone back, it, it went back up to number one in Amazon.com. I know they're working on, as yeah. it was revealed last week by Mark, I know they're working on getting a European release. Um, I love the director's cut because you can see the fact I'm crying in the last scene, um, uh -huh. which I'd never seen before, even on the big screen on the original, but they've done such a good job with the quality, you can actually see that Kinski's crying at uh -huh. the end whilst he's trying to be gentle with Babette and telling her finding a, a nice way of saying this. Um, I love the word unmade. He unmade Midian. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> Kinski for me. Um, and uh, I'm going to get through the next. <laughs> um, this is from Mick Crone. Um, this is, did you and Nick ever walk into each other on the set of Hellraiser as we were both blind? <laughs> Possibly, but we would have known it. No, no, we just kind of, we, just we might have been scenery. <laughs> <laughs> we both we both walked into scenery, other actors. Other actors. It's a bit like pinball, really, isn't it? It's like centipites <laughs> moving around. <laughs> Dodgem and cars. It's a good idea. Yeah. Centipite yeah, pinball. Yeah, centipite pinball, I think. Um, <laughs> and I think, let me just quickly skim down. These are mostly um, agreeing with your assessment about David Lynch and uh, put the book up on Amazon. Um, but, 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 yeah, this is my. Those are actually are all the questions um, that's actually that people have actually specifically asked. I'm going to turn that off. Um, Simon, this has just been <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> I do hope if you are free on the 14th that you can come and join us and read us a... a 14th or the 7th? 14th of December. The 7th is Anne Bobby. Oh, okay. Um, um, and she's going to be doing... Because we're celebrating the release of her latest movie, which she wrote. She didn't direct, she wrote it. But she acts in it. She stars in it. Uh, it's a short film uh, for the In Fear Of se series. Um, and, but, yeah, the Soskas... I, you haven't actually met the Soskas. Have you met the Soskas? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think, so. I don't think you, you, you would get on very, very well with them. Um, they're, they're, they're wonderful, wonderful ladies. But anyway, definitely Barbie, myself, and the Suskers would be, um, will be there. Um, just before everyone disappears, the 11 viewers, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, I meant to put this plea in at the beginning as well. <laughs> I've just reminded myself. Um, there is a subscribe button if you're watching this on YouTube. Please tell your friends that I'm going to be talking about subscribing to my YouTube channel a lot. Um, uh, so, yes. Uh, <laughs> Stop! Stop pulling faces! <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm going to sign off with you as your last thing now. Right, this has been Nicholas Vince. I've been chattering with Simon Bamford. About his, I can't do it. I can't speak. <laughs> This has been Nicholas Vince. I've been chattering with Simon Bamford. Oh, professionalism at all costs. I've been chattering with Simon Bamford about the luggage in the car. It's, thank you very much indeed for watching us, folks. It's been really great. You notice I've been changing colours. You have been. That little thing. I've been changing my colour all the way through the interview. <laughs> And I'm very grateful that you've had it in that effect, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should just go like, like that. Ugh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, right, listen, I'm going to end this broadcast now. Thank you very much indeed for watching us, guys, and please subscribe <laughs> to the channel. <laughs> please. Right.
Yes. Drive. Please. <laughs>